All right, everybody, uh, you can see there that the president was asked many questions, including how cocaine got into the White House, but did not answer. This is my video update from Larnica, Cyprus, on this Friday morning, July the 7th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with Alensky's NATO member state tour. It's about uh, four days before the big uh, Vilnius summit and Alensky has been ordered to visit various NATO member states and to try and get them to pledge their support for Ukraine to, uh, to enter NATO. He's not going to get that. And he is going to these NATO member states to ask them for more weapons and for more money because Alensky is always asking for more money. So uh, yesterday he was in Bulgaria and he met with Bulgarian President Radev. Today he is going to be in Czechia where he will be meeting with President Pavel. And tomorrow I believe he will be in Turkey to meet with President Erdogan. And things got really tense yesterday in Bulgaria as Alensky was pressing the Bulgarian government to give him more weapons and more money. And the Bulgarian government was telling Alensky, listen up, bro, we don't have any more weapons. And as far as money goes, well, we're tapped out there as well. So here is a bit of the exchange between Alensky and Radev. So Radev told Alensky, I do not agree to provide ammunition, especially from Bulgarian army reserves. I continue to maintain that this conflict has no military solution and more and more weapons will not solve it. Alensky objected to Radev's use of the term conflict, insisting that this is definitely a war. God forbid some tragedy should befall you and you should be in my place, Alensky added. And if people with shared values do not help, what will you do? You would say, Putin, please grab Bulgarian territory. I also want to tell you, whatever your army has in terms of munitions, it will not be enough to fight with the Russian Federation. You don't have a bad army. Your people are good but it would not be enough to fight against 160 million people. That is why it is good to give the people to defend themselves so that the war does not come to you, to the Poles, to the Romanians. War knows no distance, I can tell you, the Ukrainian leader told his host. You cannot support Russia and support a balancing position because Russia wants to destroy NATO, wants to destroy Europe and the European Union. These are their goals. Do you get me? Helensky <laughs> told Radev. Do you get me? <laughs> Do you get me, bro? <laughs> Yo, listen up, Radev. Uh, uh, listen up, Radev. Russia. Russia wants to destroy Bulgaria. It wants to destroy NATO. It wants to destroy the European Union. Your people, your people are okay. They good. They good people. But we better. <laughs> so give me money. Give me weapons. We fight Russians for you. We protect all of EU. We protect all of NATO and NATO. What, what does Ursula call it? NATO and, and EU values. Yes, we protect this. And uh, Mr. Radev, by the way, maybe you have two, three billion euros to give me so I buy home in uh, Sofia? <laughs> I'm telling you, they're, they're sending Alensky on this charm offensive, but here's the big problem. And, and this is a really big problem when you send Alensky out on, on an international charm offensive tour. 
the guy's not charming. <laughs> That's, that is the big, big problem. People don't like Alensky. I mean, the way he talked to uh, Teradev and to Bulgaria is, is pretty, pretty stunning. My God, this guy. <laughs> anyway, uh, according to Politico's description of the incident, Alensky savaged Radev and opened up with both barrels to maul the Bulgarian president, delivering his words with measured scorn and barbed irony as Radev took refuge in the sheet of paper in his hands. The Bulgarian president eventually asked the cameras to leave the room. <laughs> he savaged Radev. <laughs> With both barrels. <laughs> uh, and this is the other problem with Alensky. The collective West media is not reporting the truth. And they're not saying, you know what? Uh, Newland, Blinken, Vonda Crazy. We got to tell you, as the, as the collective West media, people don't like Alensky. <laughs> He's not charming. So you got to stop sending him out on these charm offensives. No. Instead, they build him up. So they build him up. They build up his ego. Newland reads the article from uh, Politico and Blinken reads the article from Politico and Blinken's like, yeah, yeah, my boy went to Bulgaria with both barrels ablazing and he mauled Radev and he mauled the Bulgarian people. That's my boy, Helensky. <laughs> uh, they're living in their own bubble. They need, to, they need to understand this guy is not light. He's not charming. He's not a diplomat. He's an arrogant, spoiled, deeply corrupt actor. Actor. He is an actor. <laughs> Man. Okay. So uh, he's going to go to uh, to Czechia as well, and I and I'm sure he's going to get the same type of uh, of response from Pavel. Even though Pavel is, I mean, this guy's uh, he's a NATO guy. He's also a former, I believe he was also in the uh, Communist Party, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, he's a NATO guy, a former NATO commander, and he's going to be very pro-NATO, pro-Ukraine and NATO and, and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, I don't think that Czechia has the weapons and the money to give to Ukraine. Bulgaria told him to buzz off. They don't have the weapons and the money to give to Ukraine. And I am... 100% positive that Erdogan is going to uh, to laugh at Alensky's demands. I don't think he's going to get anything from Erdogan and uh, from Turkey. I don't think Erdogan especially likes uh, Alensky. But uh, they're in a panic. They are absolutely in a panic because things are going very, very bad. Even the false flag against the ZMPP, that seems to have been uh, diffused the talk about blowing up the ZMPP in some sort of sabotage false flag event. It looks like the Russians are on top of things and it may happen, but I'm now leaning towards the perspective that it's uh, that time has passed as well. If they were going to blow up the ZMPP, it would have been yesterday, maybe today, or maybe even on, uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday so that they can allow the, the radiation and the measurements of the radiation and the collective West media to really uh, pump up the false flag before the uh, Tuesday, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday meeting in Vilnius. So they needed a couple of days to really pump up the, the false flag narrative. And it looks like that door is closing. But who knows? Uh, a false flag is really the only thing that could uh, that could save Ukraine. It could save Alensky. There are reports that NATO is going to try and put on a really a really brave face, and they're going to put their best foot forward, and they're going to say, "We support you for as long as it takes." And yes, we're going to give you whatever weapons we can cobble together, which is not much, and uh, we'll give you whatever money we can uh, put together, which is just really uh, theft and 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 a grift. Because all the money that goes to Ukraine doesn't really go to the people. It goes to, it goes back into the collective West's pockets, along with uh, 10% for the big guy. And who knows what Alensky's cut is. And, uh, and that's it. That is it. The Biden White House, on their part, they're going to try to, uh, to manage this conflict and try to extend it to, uh, 
to pass the, uh, the November 2024 elections. And I don't even want to say the Biden White House, the Democrats and the DNC, because they understand that whether it's Biden or whether it's Gavin Newsom or God help us, Kamala Harris, whoever they decide to run as president, they cannot uh, afford to have another Afghanistan multiplied by 100 debacle on the uh, on the Democrats watch. So they understand. I believe that they understand. I hope they understand that they have lost this conflict. And right now, they're just trying to manage this thing so that they can drag it out until past the elections. I believe the strategy right now from some of the more rational people in the Democrat Party, which isn't many, but I believe the thinking is let's uh, let's make this so that Ukraine has not lost and Russia has not won. That's what I believe their strategy is going to be. That is why Biden, for example, is uh, is now going to be giving cluster uh, munitions to uh, to the Alensky regime. They understand that the ammo, it's not working. They cannot uh, outproduce Russia in ammunition. They just don't have the, the capacity to produce that type of ammo. It's getting deep now. And, uh, and the goal is now to, to give, or at least the talk is, that Biden has greenlit uh, cluster munitions to the Alensky regime in lieu of ammunition. And what are, what, what are the cluster munitions going to do? Well, they're just going to make things miserable for, uh, for the people of, uh, of this area. And so they'll, uh, they'll extend the war out, giving these type of weapons, and then attack them as well. It'll just extend the war out, and uh, it'll essentially just, uh, just cause a lot of long-term damage in, uh, in the area that eventually will be... Uh, part of Russia or have some sort of connection to Russia. So the strategy is to drag this thing out, get it past the November 24 elections so that they don't have to deal with some sort of uh, international foreign policy disaster and uh, and ruin, destroy the whole, uh, the whole area that, that will be Russian or have some sort of connection to Russia. You know, kind of just... If we can't have it, well, then no one can have it. So that, that's what my thinking is on, on all of this. Of course, the neocons, the Vander Crazies, the Burrells, the neolibs, like, uh, like the Blinkens. Not that there's much difference anymore between neocons and neolibs. There really isn't a difference. But all of these people, they absolutely want to escalate. They absolutely want World War III. They absolutely want to destroy Russia. But, you know, that dream is, is becoming more and more distant for them and uh, they haven't realized it yet that they have lost but you know maybe maybe it'll hit the neocons sometime in the future that that this is over though i doubt it neocons have no reverse gear and they just keep on pressing and pressing even though they keep on losing and losing but i do believe that there are forces in the pentagon and in the dnc and with the democrat party that are like okay we're done. We're cooked. Let's try to, uh, to just keep this thing going until after the elections. Anyway, that is the Alensky NATO member state tour that he is on. The charm offensive for Alensky. Four days until the big Vilnius summit. And uh, they'll, they'll present. They will present uh, a united NATO. That's what they're going to try to do. But make no mistake about it. NATO is fractured. And they're panicking. They understand that they've lost. And uh, always look at actions, not words. Bulgaria, if, uh, if Olensky was winning and Ukraine was winning, Bulgaria would be like, absolutely have more money, have more weapons. Czechia would be like, have more money, more weapons. Turkey, Erdogan would be like, yeah, Olensky, here are more weapons. Here's more money. If Ukraine was winning, that would be the reaction. Biden would not be giving cluster munitions. He would, uh, he would be providing whatever other weapons he could because Alensky and Ukraine was winning, but they're not winning. Look at the actions. Look at the actions and not the, uh, the words. And if Ukraine was winning, 
they wouldn't be running around asking for, for weapons and money. Anyway, let's move on now to the Russian missile strike that happened not yesterday evening, but Wednesday evening. Yesterday, we had Russian missile strikes in, uh, Russian drone strikes, I believe, in Kiev. And they hit uh, military facilities in Kiev. And on Wednesday evening, I believe Wednesday evening, there was a big missile strike in Lviv, in the west of uh, Ukraine. And the Russian Ministry of Defense, one sec, they actually put out a statement, which I've bookmarked and I will read to you on the big strike in Lvov, which was with Calibre missiles. And this is what the Russian Ministry of Defense said. The purpose of today's strike on the reserves of Ukraine was Western equipment and militants on the territory of the military academy in Lvov. Western armored vehicles were on the territory with a high degree of probability, British Challenger tanks. It is also reported that on the territory of the Academy of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, at the time of the strike, there were up to 800 armed forces of Ukraine and foreign mercenaries. Now, Blinken, he was very, very upset with this strike on what the Russian Ministry of Defense says was a military academy with mercenaries, foreign mercenaries. I imagine U.S., U.K., Polish uh, mercenaries were at this uh, facility. And uh, Blinken, he put out a tweet condemning Russia's uh, strike on this academy. And here is what Blinken said. Russia's attack on the western Ukrainian city of Lviv is yet another example of the Kremlin's brutality and why support for Ukraine's defense against the Kremlin's aggression is vital. U.S. commitment to Ukraine is unwavering. It's unwavering, but it is wavering. <laughs> it is wavering in a big, big way. And Alensky is panicking. So CNN, they also ran a story saying that the Russians hit a residential apartment building. The Russians claim that they hit a military academy and they knocked out a whole bunch of mercenaries. Who knows? Who knows what happened? But uh, the Russian military is absolutely targeting mercenaries now they are it seems like every facility that they hit is a facility is a is a facility where you have a whole bunch of mercenaries uh, housed and of course you can make the argument that uh that any military facility that you hit in ukraine will now have mercenaries because most of ukraine's military or a big portion of ukraine's military is now made up of foreign mercenaries but but Russia is, is uh, targeting facilities, and those facilities have a whole bunch of foreign mercenaries. And I imagine what's going to be happening in the next few months is that the collective West nations that are sending these mercenaries to Ukraine, they're going to have to report on the deaths of these mercenaries. For example, the death of American uh, mercenaries, soldiers in Ukraine, and that's not going to be a good look. That is why Blinken and the Biden White House is going to be very upset with, uh, with what the Russians are doing as they're striking these, uh, these facilities because it's going to, to really look bad for the Biden White House as more and more Americans are, uh, more American mercenaries are being annihilated in Ukraine. And the media is going to have to. They're going to be forced to report on this. You're not going to be able to hide this much longer what they've been saying for, for now is they've been saying that these Americans are part of uh, NGOs and they're in Ukraine as, uh, as part of some, uh, some NGO outfit. And that's the excuse that they've been using to, to justify the presence of so many Americans or so many British in Ukraine. But you're not going to be able to hide that much longer because the Russians are, or it appears the Russians are demolishing the facilities 
where these mercenaries are uh, hanging out in. So let's now move to, to Yellen's trip to China, and then we'll do a clown world. And this is, I guess this is a kind of a pre-clown world because Yellen made her way to China and uh, it did not go over too well in the first day or two of Yellen's trip. So she's in China to, to talk with Chinese officials and to see if they can uh, get their relations, their relationship back on track. I don't know why the Chinese would trust Yellen given everything that happened with Blinken and Biden, 24 hours after Blinken's trip to Beijing, Biden calling Xi Jinping a dictator. I don't know why the Chinese would, uh, would listen to Yellen, but anyway, they, they, they allowed her to, to visit Beijing, which is something they didn't allow Joseph Burrell to do. And uh, I have to say that it appears Yellen got a pretty cold reception because usually when uh, these officials, these very high-level officials like Yellen, go on these big diplomatic missions, usually they'll, they'll have uh, the talks in the day, and then the itinerary would be for some sort of uh, dinner or working dinner in the evening, and that's how these things usually go. There's, there's usually not much time for... Uh, sightseeing or hanging out at bars or restaurants and if there is any sightseeing it's usually part of the itinerary you know the your the host nation will take you on an official visit to see some some sort of site or monument or something like that but uh, in this case it appears that yellen made her way to china had a meeting in the daytime and the chinese were like okay well Nice, uh, nice talking with you. We'll see you tomorrow morning. You know, go, go find a restaurant to have dinner at because there are a whole bunch of photos on the interwebs which uh, show Janet Yellen at a restaurant. Looks like a, a good restaurant. Just hanging out, having food, and she wasn't invited to some sort of an official dinner or some sort of working dinner. It looks like the Chinese met with her and they cut her loose after the meeting and just told her to, to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> go, go to the city and grab some food. And that's not a good sign. This tweet here from CNY says, instead of dining with senior Chinese officials, Janet Yellen opted to have her dinner at a Yunnan cuisine restaurant in Beijing. The restaurant owner mentioned that Yellen, that Yellen has a penchant for mushrooms and ordered four servings of the delectable wild mushroom dishes. And it has a photo of the dish right there as well. <laughs> so they try to, to spin this as Yellen opted to, uh, to have dinner at a restaurant in Beijing. She didn't opt to have dinner at a restaurant in Beijing. The Chinese officials they didn't bother having some sort of uh, evening plans made for, uh, for Yellen. <laughs> and that says a lot. That really does say a lot. We'll see what will happen with Yellen's trip to China. I don't think anything's going to come out of it. I think we're heading towards escalation and conflict. We're on the escalation escalator. And uh, whatever chance we did have with, with uh, Blinken's meeting in Beijing, Biden completely spiked that. He completely ruined whatever chance at de-escalation was left. Never say never. There's always a possibility that things can get back on track. But I don't think, I don't think Yellen, Janet Yellen, is the person to put things back on track. That's for sure. So let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. And in this clown world, let's talk about the, uh, the white powder stuff at the White House. And Dmitry Medvedev, he put out a tweet the other day commenting on the white powder stuff at the White House. And this is what Dmitry Medvedev said. Cocaine was found in the White House. Looks like instead of F-16s, a sedative has been prepared for the Kiev kitty. <laughs> That was a tweet from Medvedev and Dan Bongino. He put out this tweet 
There's absolutely zero chance anyone other than a family member brought that cocaine inside the White House complex. No chance. That would make it past the MAG security checkpoints. Family bypasses those. And Bongino would know because Bongino, he was Secret Service, wasn't he? I believe under Obama. So if anyone would know the, the security measures at the White House, it would be Bongino. And Politico, they put out an article with the title, White House Cocaine Culprit Unlikely to be Found, Law Enforcement Official. And then Politico writes, and this is great, they write, Lines may have been snorted and crossed, but it's possible we won't know by whom. <laughs> even Politico, even Politico is having fun with this story. Lines may have been snorted and bypassed, but we don't know by whom. <laughs> is this really that difficult of a case to crack? <laughs> I mean, the cocaine was, was in the West Wing, from what I understand. And, <laughs> and there's only a few people, like family members, who, uh, who hang out in this area. And, well, there's a couple of people near and dear to, uh, to Joe Biden who, who have this, this type of, uh, of addiction. <laughs> we all know that one of them is, is uh, Biden's son. And then there's Zelensky. And I don't know, was, was Alensky in uh, D.C. the past couple of days? Maybe. Maybe he made a secret trip to the White House. But uh, if you cross out Alensky, then you're, you're pretty much left with, with only one person. I mean, that's what I imagine. But I don't know. I could be wrong. Maybe there's someone else in the White House that is uh, taking, taking part in the white sugary substance, snorting the white sugary substance. Who knows? But uh, boy, has Biden, has the Biden White House really disgraced, on a serious note, he really has disgraced the, uh, the White House and, and the United States of America. To be honest, it's such a bad look. It really is embarrassing for the U.S. as a whole to have this guy and his family and this type of thing taking place at the White House. It's just such a bad look. It really is. And it's sad to see it really is sad to see this type of stuff making its way out there. And, and you know, for this to, to have been reported on means that uh, there must have been many, many instances of this type of stuff happening. And eventually something made it through. Something made it through to the, me to the media. And, uh, and it's now international news. So... Uh, that's the clown world, everybody. I'm trying to think if I have another clown world to report on. Oh, did you see the, uh, the, the leaked Prigozhin um, videos and images from uh, the Russian authorities when they raided Prigozhin and Wagner's headquarters in St. Petersburg and they uh, raided uh, Prigozhin's penthouse in St. Petersburg? They found all kinds of interesting thing, things, and this stuff was leaked to the interwebs. And they found a whole lot of cash stashed away in Prigozhin's apartment and gold bars and guns and fitness equipment. They found all kinds of things that Prigozhin was, was hiding. And obviously, Prigozhin was a pretty, pretty out there, eccentric, nutty guy. I think that's, that's now... That's now pretty much confirmed that the guy was, was a bit cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. But uh, the, the other thing that they found, which was kind of interesting, was the images of, uh, of Prigozhin's various identities. And this was published on the interwebs. And so Prigozhin would, he would take on these various identities, like Mission Impossible type of stuff. And he would, when he was traveling on Wagner mission, missions... He would, he would disguise himself, and you're seeing some of the disguises right now on the screen. <laughs> Pretty wild stuff, I have to admit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's Prigozhin uh, for you. So, you know, I, I, I don't think, looking at all of this stuff, I don't think it, it was a big jump 
for Prigozhin from, uh, from this type of activity, these identities, gold bars, cash stashed away and all of these things. I don't think it was a big jump from where, where he was to where he eventually ended up, which is uh, the, the mutiny of Wagner. Obviously, the guy was, was troubled and eccentric and, and probably compromised and witnessing everything that was happening in Bakhmut. And yeah, he, he did what he did. So I thought that was just kind of, kind of interesting to, to see. And... And Ukraine, uh, pro-Ukraine analysts are saying that this is going to upset Wagner and they're going to see these images and these leaks of these images and they're going to be very upset and they're going to start another mutiny. And I'm just like, no, that's not going to happen, guys. Wagner, whatever forces in Wagner are legit, they're already part of the Russian military. Everybody else is making their way to Bulgaria or already in Bulgaria. And uh, these images were probably leaked by the FSB, by the uh, Russian state to, uh, to the media to post on uh, social media because I think they want these images out there so that they can present uh, Prigozhin as, uh, as a very out there eccentric guy. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, the different identities, that's the interesting part to all of this. I'm going to sign out the Duran.locals.com. We are on... Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and Rockfin. Go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.